We'll go ahead and get down here. I'm not going to be at that podium all night. It's a little um, confining up there. And in fact, when I'm on board ship working in the polar regions, I'm very used to walking around the uh, presentation room on the first deck in the bowels of the ship. So sometimes it's a little funny when I come to places like this. It's strange to me because usually I'm rocking back <laughs> and forth, sometimes violently. Sometimes I have to brace myself. So th this is actually a treat to, to be still. But let's, um, let's go back a little bit because, and by the way, let me say at the start here, please feel free to ask questions as I go through the presentation and I will do my best to, to answer them and then, of course, continue on with the presentation. But feel free to ask questions as I go along. I get a question a lot, and it started many years ago now. And I had to think about it because no one had actually posed the question before that time. They said, well, you're a native Floridian, right? And I said, well, yes. I said, how did you end up being a polar historian? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And I thought about it, and I said, no, it doesn't make any sense. But here's what happened. Several years ago, because I grew up on the east coast of Florida, just down from Cape Kennedy, several years ago, I grew up with the space program, as a matter of fact, okay? And I saw all the space launches. And uh, there's a lot of correlation between space exploration and polar exploration. It's very cold in space. Very cold in space, okay? So there's that correlation to my research that I've done since, as Daryl mentioned, 1975. I started when I was 12. I started doing this when I was 12 years old. Another thing is my father uh, was very interested in history and we used to talk quite a bit about historical subjects, all kinds of historical subjects. And I grew up on Merritt Island, Merritt Island on the East Coast. And being an island, when I went to the beach, I was very curious as to what was beyond the horizon. Okay, so there was that adventurous spirit there. Also, too, at the age of 12, I began collecting medals for campaign services, naval campaigns and things like this throughout the last couple of centuries. And this fueled my interest in geography as well as maritime exploration, and that led into the polar exploration. And finally, and, and people sometimes don't believe this when I say it, but and it's true, okay? I, I realized, because I became introspective about this, I realized that I'm the opposite attracts kind of person. So what is the antithesis of living in Florida, in a subtropical climate? Yeah, that's right. That's, I think all these things conspired to my actually becoming quite fascinated with the polar regions, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, all these years. Let's go ahead and look a little bit here. Uh, really the correlation between the space exploration a little bit and of course polar exploration. Things that, that really, there we go, I guess, there, okay, great. Um, this is an image of the Apollo 13 spacecraft, the Saturn V rocket that blasted off in April of 1970, almost 50 years ago now. And it wasn't of course, but a couple of days later that there was a major, accident in the spacecraft and three uh, astronauts were trapped in the frigid void of space so it took literally hundreds of human and computerized minds to save these men who were on their way to the moon and get them back to earth but they did save the men and they learned a lot in the process about how to operate on uh, very thin margins in space because when you're talking about space and when you're talking about the polar regions, there's really two things. There's black and there's white. There's life. There's death. There's not much in between when you're dealing with these subjects. So the men of Apollo 13 made it back to Earth and were safe. And we're here, of course, to talk about the Northwest Passage, the Northwest Passage, and here's a map of the Canadian Arctic. And if you think about over hundreds of years as Europeans strove to travel through the Northwest Passage, to them, to the Europeans, the Arctic was the moon. That was their moon during that time period. It wasn't until the 20th century, well into the 20th century, of course, that we reached the moon. Well, it was only in the very early part of the 20th century that man actually reached the North Pole. 
and the South Pole. So there's, there's some correlations there. What you can see here is today the, what we know, of course, the Northwest Passage and the Arctic and the various routes to go through there. Here's Alaska, for example, and over here in the Canadian Arctic, that area. Well, the thing is, is that over time, when people were trading, when Europeans were trading, and they wanted to get the luxury goods from the Far East, they wanted textiles, they wanted silk, they wanted jewels and spices and these kinds of things, a lot of times these things were brought over land, or they had to be brought through a sea route that was very, very long around the southern part of Africa and through the Indian Ocean to the Far East. So the struggle to reach and discover the Northwest Passage was over time a very peculiar thing for the British because the British were at the end of these long trading routes. The British are the ones that paid the highest price because they were the furthest away from the goods. So the whole discovery of the passage, or the uh, search for the discovery of the passage, became a uniquely British affair. It became a British obsession. And it took 350 years for that to happen. What eventually happened is by the 1800s, the early 1800s, it was realized that there really wasn't going to be a practical route through the Arctic. Why was this? The reason was is the ice. The ice changed and shifted from year to year. Sometimes it was at lower latitudes than others. And you could never really understand where the ice was going to be and how it was going to affect your voyage. So they realized that no, a practical route through the Northwest Passage for trade is just not going to happen. In place of that impetus to try to reach the Northwest Passage and go through it were political and scientific reasons. The political reasons were perhaps very, very obvious when you look at a map. Who knows what Alaska used to be? Russian America. That's right, it used to be owned by the Russians until about 1867. So what happened is the Russians were researching and pushing to the east, closer and closer to British North America, what we know today as Canada. So the British didn't like that. They said, you know, you're getting a little too close to our territory there, and we don't want you discovering the passage before we do. But there were also scientific reasons. It wasn't unknown in that day and time, 200 years ago now, it wasn't unknown the, the effects of global warming. There were certainly signs of global warming and changes of the climate. It affected crops in Britain, for example. So there were some scientific questions to be answered as well. So these reasons really rep replaced the idea of, well, we're going to go through and we're going to find a passage for trade. Now it got political and it got much more scientific. So in 1845, by this time, there were still huge areas all along here that were not known of the Arctic. But there was this thin strip right here through the passage up to an area called Melville Island in a very small piece of what was called Banks land, okay? So the British figured, well, let's, let's have another go at this, okay? Let's try one more time to go through, sail through that passage, and make that discovery and claim the glory for it. These two ships, HMS Erebus and Terror, under the command of Sir John Franklin, a veteran Arctic explorer, were sent through the passage. He had with him 128 men. And they left in May of 1845, and they disappeared. One year went by, two years went by, three years went by, and nobody heard from these men. Nobody had sighted them. The whalers who were in the area, no sign. So people started becoming very, very concerned. Officially, officially, the Admiralty was still pretty calm, British stiff upper lip and all that, right? But they too became concerned and they started putting together search expeditions, both by land and by sea. One expedition in 1848 followed what was supposed to be Franklin's path through the Arctic. They returned in 1849 empty-handed. They could not find a trace of the missing expedition. So they re-equipped the two ships that they sent out to search, HMS Investigator and HMS Enterprise, for another go. But this time they were going to do something very different. 
Instead of following Franklin's path, they were going to go ahead and go all the way around the continents of South America and North America and go through the Bering Strait. They were going to try and find Franklin from the western side of the passage. But a lot of this area was still unknown. So those ships would be going in unknown territory and taking every bit of a risk just like Franklin had taken. Now, some of you are wondering, well, why two ships? Why don't you just send one ship? Why do you have to send two ships? Well, this is the reason. If one ship gets in trouble and gets stuck in the ice, they can offload those crews into the other ship, and there you go. It's a safety net. It's a safety net. That's why you have two ships. It's very important. And this expedition to send HMS Investigator and HMS Enterprise on that rescue mission will go terribly wrong. Here are the two men who were leaders on that expedition. The gentleman on the left, Captain Richard Collinson. He was in overall command in charge of HMS Enterprise, and he was the superior of the gentleman on the right, <coughs> Commander Robert Le Mesuvier McClure. Now, McClure had a lot of Arctic experience. He'd been on two expeditions, the one just previous to this one and one back in the 1830s. He was a very seasoned explorer. He was also very, very ambitious. McClure wanted to discover the passage, get a name for himself, and that fame and hopefully the financial rewards that would come with it. On the other side of it, Dr. or rather Captain Richard Collinson was a very able surveyor, very accomplished, had almost no experience. He had some slight Antarctic experience, but really no experience in the polar regions at all. So on the face of it, it looks like, hey, this is a good match. We've got one guy in charge who is going to be calling the shots based on, right, the other gentleman who's got the experience. So they support each other. That, I think, was the idea. But unfortunately, what happened is when the ships were sailing around the Horn of South America, they became separated. I'll get to that in just a moment. On board, on board you had, and these are actual images from the Illustrated London News, a very well-known newspaper of the day. And on board you have the sailors and the marines of Her Majesty's service. And you can see how noble they look and how noble they are made to be and heroic. This is very, very Victorian uh, of that time. So, and it wasn't unusual, and if you look here, you'll see a young boy here, and you'll see a young drummer boy here as well, okay? It wasn't unusual for people to join the service in that day and time, nine, ten years old. They were nine and ten years old, and they learned how to be sailors and how to be Marines at that age. So, if you say serve 20 years, you could easily be 29, 30 years old, and you've already got two-thirds of your life in the service. So it wasn't unusual at all. Even when I was a boy, when I was 15 years old, I went aboard a British ship at Cape Canaveral, and there was a guy who had been in the service for seven years. He was only 21 years old. He was only 21 because they still allowed people to join at age 14 during that time period. So all this isn't very far removed, even in a way, from my experiences, for example. So we get back to the story here, and we have the two ships that go around the horn of South America, and they're sailing in the Pacific, and the storm comes up, and they're separated. They never meet again. They never meet again. Now, part of this is because of logistics. It's a big ocean. They're supposed to meet at the Bering Strait before they go into the Arctic. That's the easy answer. The more difficult answer is McClure was up to no good. McClure wanted to make sure that he would be alone in the Arctic and grab the glory of the Northwest Passage. So he made sure that he and his ship would be in the Arctic by themselves. That was, that was the plan. Along the way, there was a gentleman, this gentleman you see, named Johann August Merchant, and he was a Moravian missionary who had been in Labrador for several years. Mirchin was pretty fluent in the Inuit language, and he was assigned to accompany the British on their ships in order to communicate with Inuit people, what we used to call the Eskimo, 
but today's term is Inuit, to communicate with them and hopefully find out information about the missing expedition. That was his purpose of being there. He was supposed to be on Collinson's ship, but because of there not being necessarily enough room, temporarily he was on the investigator, McClure's ship. Well, when the two ships were separated, there you go. Merching remained permanently with McClure. This is the area here of Alaska, and this is where McClure was eventually sailing his ship right here into this area. And over here is that little piece of land we call Banks Land on the other map. And there's Melville Island. And these will play very important parts in the story. That's why I mentioned them in particular. What McClure did is he sailed his ship along the Alaskan coast here, and then he struck northward and found new land, land that nobody, no white man, had ever seen before. And he kept going into an area called the Prince of Wales Strait. Well, why was he doing this? He was doing it because he knew that eventually, if he could go far enough, he would run into what was called Viscount Melville Sound. And that's the extent of what was known of the Northwest Passage at that time. In other words, he knew he could discover the passage. He could just get his ship through there. So he pushed his ship further and further into Prince of Wales Strait. And then he was stopped. He was stopped by the ice. Here's a great image done by one of the officers on board who we'll see in a minute. His name was Cresswell. Samuel Gurney Cresswell, a very, very fine artist and a second, uh, third in command of the ship. And he had created several watercolors that were later made into lithographs and sold of the journey. And it's thanks to him that we have a very vivid and very accurate story, pictorial story, of the expedition. So that's the first sighting of land right here. And there he is. And there he is. So, I told you that the ship was going through Prince of Wales Strait, and then it was blocked by the ice. But not just any ice. The ice that he was blocked by was the Arctic ice stream coming out of what's called the Beaufort Sea. And this is old paleocrystic ice. When I say that, I'm talking about ice that's dozens of feet thick and ancient, and generally doesn't melt. It stays just like that, and it pushes its way through here past this area here, Banks Land, Banks Island, and down here through this area, right to a place called King William Island. That's where Franklin was. Franklin's ships were tracked down in this area right here. Meanwhile, McClure and his ship, investigator, up here. So he was hundreds of miles away from Franklin's people. He never knew it. There's no way he could know it. But what he could do when the ice stopped him is he could get a group of men together and form a sledding party and go and get a physical and a visual reference on where the Northwest Passage was, that particular part of the passage. And that's what he did. This is about October of 1850. So he set off. It's very late in the season now. Okay, it's very late in the season. But he set off and he wanted to go ahead and confirm for sure that he was the discoverer of the passage. And that's what he did in October of 1850. And this is how he addressed to go out and do that. Okay, a lot of the materials that these guys wore were made out of wool, for example. And uh, wool, unfortunately, when it gets wet, it doesn't repel the water too much, it retains the water. So it wasn't a very, very good material to use to keep, keep warm. But, you know, they did the best they could during this time. Okay, and typically, an officer would carry, as you can see here, as a shotgun slung across his back, and he would carry probably a telescope to do some reconnoitering and this kind of thing. We'll talk more about the sledding a little bit later, but I wanted to show you that image. Okay? So what happened is he took investigator as far as he could go, and he said, okay, I've come back. I know that the passage is there. I know I can make it to the Viscount Melville Sound, and I can sail home if it weren't for the ice. And he made a fatal decision. He made a very, very difficult decision, and that was to actually spend the winter in the ice. 
as that ice is moving around. Nobody had deliberately wintered in the ice before. And no, no exploration ship. So what he, this is another one of Cresswell's images. So what he did was he went ahead and wintered in that ice and he wanted to wait till spring because not only did he want another shot at the passage, but he also wanted to send out sledding parties to go look for the missing expedition. To his credit, he did make an effort to find Franklin and his men. He did make an honest effort to do that. So you can't take that away from him. But his ambition would lead him to do things that would risk not only his ship, but every single man on board. Here's a good image of the apparatus, the warming apparatus, which kept you fairly comfortable. And when I say fairly comfortable, I'm talking probably 32 degrees below deck. That was probably fairly comfortable at that time, okay? What it was is it was basically a furnace that had pipes that spread all throughout the ship. And you went ahead and you know kept you warm during the winter. And also, uh, of course, you had coal to, to fire it and to supply it throughout that time. Now, when the springtime came, this is 1851 during this time. Are you saying that they stayed on that ship as opposed to being on the land? Correct. She, she, the lady asked a question, uh, was I saying that they stayed on the ship as opposed to on land? Yes, they were in the strait and they stayed on board the ship, okay? Which was a great risk to do that, okay? So by the time 1851 came in the spring, the ice, okay, isn't breaking up yet. The ice doesn't break up probably till August, you know, September of that time period. This is earlier than that. This is the summertime and the spring. And what you do is you load up your sleds with supplies and you get some men and you haul those sleds and you go looking for those lost men. So you had a sledding party. This is where the ship was right here at the northern end of the strait. You had one party led by Cresswell that went to the northwest. Another party head by a man named Mate Winniet that went here to the southeast. And then one going really far south, led by Lieutenant Haswell, who was second in command. So there was, again, an honest effort to find Franklin's men. But as I've shown you, they were way, way far away from where Franklin was, and they couldn't know it. Here's some great examples of what it was like studying, and I think this is pretty accurate because these were drawn by an officer of another expedition. And uh, what you're doing is you're pulling these sleds about 200 to 225 pounds per man, okay, for weeks, sometimes months at a time. And you're going over these huge hummocks of ice. And I can tell you, it's not fun, okay? Having walked around a bit in the polar regions, sometimes up to my hip in snow, it's not fun at all, okay? This is a good representation of what it was like. On occasion, you would attach a sail. That's right, a sail to your sled, and that would help maybe propel it along a bit. There was a certain romance to these sleds, by the way, because the British sailors, being sailors, okay, they liked the fact, of course, that these sleds were literally launched from their ships they christened them, they had names, and they even had their own flags, okay? So they treated them as their own little land ships. That's why it was a very, very sailorly thing to do, you see? But this is real, and uh, this was actually something that was used not just in the Arctic, but decades later in the Antarctic. In the Antar Antarctic, excuse me. Now, sometimes you had misadventures, and you had uh, polar bears poking around, of course. It's their environment, and they're poking around, and you set up your, your camp and everything, and maybe in the middle of the night, you get woken up by one of these bears, right? That's what, that, that's what could happen easily, and in fact, it did happen, certainly. In this case, this is a smaller bear, not, not something that is maybe as threatening. Uh, but very curious, <clears throat> and uh, certainly gives you pause. <laughs> One of the things that was done to help find Franklin's men is they launched balloons that had slow burning fuses on them. And the fuses released these brightly colored pieces of silk with writing on them in order to find these men and perhaps they had writing on them that would tell them where there were supplies waiting for them or where some of the ships were located that were looking for them and things like that. That was one of the ingenious ways of uh, perhaps contacting some of Franklin's men. Okay.
So that, that uh, is, is one of the many ways that they used to hopefully contact the men. Another thing they used to do is they would actually have uh, the name of the ship and maybe its location engraved on a collar that they would attach to wild foxes. And they would hope that uh, some of Franklin's men would capture these foxes, right, for food, and they would find these collars. So there was, there was different, different sort of um, ways to hopefully contact the men because, of course, they have no idea how far away these men are. Okay, so when it came time to break out of the ice, they had to actually help the process. They used various tools, and this was a ice saw that they used, and they went there and they actually cut lanes of water, okay, of ice from the water, in order to get the ship through there and get it back to more open water. And this, as you can imagine, was very, very hard work. Very, very hard work. It's backbreaking work. And um, when you're in the polar regions in particular, there's not a whole lot to do but work. And this is what these men did, of course, day after day. Okay? McClure made an attempt, as he had before, to go this way through to Count Melville Sound, or Viscount Melville Sound. But the ice again blocked him, so he couldn't do that. He knew from the sledding parties that it was probable that he was right there um, alongside an island. It wasn't just a piece of land, okay, connected to another piece of land. It probably was an island. He made that assumption. And what he did is he took the investigator and he went down Prince of Wales Strait and followed the coastline around as much as he could until he came to a place called the Bay of Mercy or Mercy Bay. That's what he called it. It turns out that Mercy Bay was anything but merciful. Okay? Here's a good image, again, from Cresswell of some of the ice that the investigator encountered along the way. This is no exaggeration. This is no exaggeration at all. What you have here is you have an iceberg that's literally shoved the investigator up another, next to another piece of ice that's been grounded. And this is a very, very vivid an accurate depiction of just one of the times the investigator and all her men were almost destroyed. What did McClure run into as he went around what he now knew must be an island is again that ice stream. So when he came around the northern part of the island and started going down, it became tighter and tighter and tighter and he became closer and closer to the coast. So he knew he had to find a sanctuary and that's when he went into Mercy Bay. But he realized too late that he had made a mistake when he sent out the sledding parties in 1851. He realized that he should have sent somebody over to, that's right, Melville Island, over to an area here, a place called Winter Harbor. And he should have done that and left a note about where he was located because he knew there was another expedition coming from the east. But he didn't do that, and he was truly all alone in the Arctic. As you can see, this is a very graphic depiction of what it was like being literally ensconced in a harbor with the ice around. You, you know, actually build the ice up along the ship okay, for protection. And you can see some of the men here capturing some of those foxes and fox traps here to put the collars on them. Very bleak. What McClure didn't realize, what really nobody realized until it was too late, was that when you go into a bay like that in the Arctic, the ice doesn't break up every year. That's right. The ice does not break up every year. And because it doesn't break up every year, it means that you may not be able to get your ship out of that place that following summer. So this is what they began to realize as 1851 went into 1852. And 1852 went into 1853. The ice wasn't breaking up. They couldn't move the ship. So McClure had to make some decisions about the food on board because they didn't have enough food to stay up there indefinitely. And he started rationing the food. He started saying, okay, we're going to cut the rations and we're going to cut the rations again. And after a while, the men, of course, are getting thinner and thinner. And they're really feeling the cold. And they're starting to be affected by things like scurvy, which is a disease from lack of vitamin C, for example. So there's more and more dire circumstance these men are under. 
And McClure realizes that he's not going to be able to probably get his men out. Not all of them, anyhow. And he makes a decision which is literally a death sentence for most of the men on board. What he's going to do is he's going to keep a certain number of men on board and he's going to split the rest of them into two parties. And he's going to send one of them to the east with the hope of finding the whalers that are in the eastern Arctic. He's going to send the other group to the south, to the Hudson Bay Company outpost in northern Canada. This is the, the fur traders in northern Canada. But it's a death sentence because these men are very weak and they're starving. But he wants to make sure that he still discovers the passage. So he keeps a certain number on board. He keeps the healthiest men on board. And he's going to make a breakout in 1853 in the spring. During this time, they're constantly looking for food, constantly hunting. There's caribou, reindeer, they call it. There's fox. There's some other animals, muskox, for example. There's birds. But they become rather scarce. And in one of these hunting parties, the sergeant of marines, Woon, his name was Sergeant Woon, he's looking for all the animals he can find, and he runs across some of his compatriots who are also looking and trying to hunt. And he sees one gentleman who is one of the only two black sailors on board. And the poor man is delirious because he's lost his way. And he's given up hope. He thinks, I'm just going to lay here and die. And Woon says, no, no, you must not do that. You must get up. You must go. And he cajoles the man and he drags the man, and he carries the man until he can do no more. He does this for hours, nine, ten hours, until finally, until finally, Woon says, look, I've got to go to the ship and bring help. I cannot, I cannot do any more for you. And as he goes off, he finds one of the rescue parties that sent for them, and he brings them back to the man, and it saves his life. And afterward, much later, Woon is given a special medal for his bravery, not just for life-saving, but also for the fact that when he went hunting, he killed two muskox bulls and provided hundreds of pounds of meat to the starving men. So he's given a special award, this award, which is now in the Canadian Museum. I'll tell you something in the book which I discovered and followed up on, I should say, quite a bit. In the early 1970s, a gentleman wrote that that particular sailor, his name was Anderson, was a runaway slave. Probably was a runaway slave. Didn't really know that for sure. And I was very intrigued by that. And I was able to uncover enough circumstantial evidence to pretty much prove that he probably was a runaway slave. And that's in the book as well. So what finally happened when this plan that McClure had to send these parties to their deaths only days before, only days before, a sled from one of the rescue ships arrived. They had found the note in Winter Harbor, and they came to get them from a ship called HMS Resolute. And this is a scene of that rescue, where they had discovered the investigator trapped in Mercy Bay. And they brought the news that the other expedition was just across Viscount Melville Sound and that they could take the men back home. But it didn't happen, because McClure said, no, 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 I can get out by myself. I don't need any help. <laughs> why, why was he doing this? Because he wanted the glory. He wanted to discover the passage. And he was still willing to risk his men to do so. So the commander of the rescue squadron, of the rescue ships, said, look, if you can get 20 men to stay with you, 20 men, you can do it. He only got four. <laughs> Everybody else wanted to go home. Okay? He only wanted to go home. That's right. So he wasn't too happy, but McClure was um, very much the politician, as if you don't know that by now. And, and McClure realized that if he abandoned the ship on his authority, he was going to be responsible. So he pulled a fast one. He got the other commander of the other expedition to order him to abandon the ship. I didn't want to leave, 
he told me I had to. Okay? So, so this, would, this would play very much into the politics uh, that would happen in England after the expedition. So when they finally did abandon the ship, it was only after that time, or after uh, they discovered that you know, the ship was there and they were rescued, it was after that time that some of the investigators did die. And three of the men were buried in Mercy Bay. They were buried there, and uh, they're still there to this day on the land. So they lost three men before they ever really fully abandoned the ship. What they did is they went and marched over land, over the ice, I should say, and went to the other rescue ships. And as those rescue ships were actually transiting, going eastward back to England, they got stuck for another winter. So the investigators were in their fourth winter. Two more men died. Two more men died in the Arctic. Here's a good image that Creswell had done showing the abandonment where they've got a party and they're dragging it over the ice and you can see the officer up here on top of the hummock, right? Seeing what's ahead and the men hauling the sled up these, you know, really, really precipitous pieces of ice. I mean, it's, it's very much like this. It's very much like this. So what they did was they went from Mercy Bay over here to the southern part of Melville Island, they were stuck about halfway, and they spent another winter. Well, they had to abandon those two ships, yeah. and they had to go back over here to this area, a place called Beachy Island. There were two more ships there. They abandoned those ships, <laughs> and they took a fifth ship. They were trying to crowd everybody on a fifth ship when um, a supply ship arrived with another vessel, so they could spread the men out. And they eventually did make it back home from the Arctic in October of 1854. They left in January of 1850. So these men had gone through a horrendous experience. I'll give you, I'll give you a little idea, though, of, of what can happen personally. This is a positive story. What can happen personally in these circumstances? Um, I was very fortunate to actually have contact with a lot of descendants of these people one of whom, as a matter of fact, lives uh, close to Tallahassee, so he's not that, that far away. I've met him personally. But what can happen is, I met one lady um, through email, and I asked her about her connections to the investigator and these men. She said, well, I'm related to two men. How's that possible, I asked. And she said, well, one of the gentlemen on board had a very good friend he had made. And when they got back to England, he introduced him to his 19-year-old daughter, and they got married. Aww. So there you go. She actually has a direct relationship to two of the investigators because of that. Yeah, yeah. And that's just one example of the, the relationship there that happens between these men. So they made it back, and all these years later, when I was in the process of writing about this story, because it took nine years to write this book, Right? In 2010, the investigator was discovered in Mercy Bay. It indeed had not, had not floated out of Mercy Bay and been destroyed. It went down right pretty much where it had been abandoned in 1853, almost intact, about 30 feet below the surface of the water. So when I found this, found this out, I contacted the folks at Parks Canada who had dough on the wreck. It took them about 15 minutes, by the way, to find it <laughs> because the ice had cleared. So it was, it was a very fortunate discovery. When I found out this had happened, I called up Parks Canada and I left a message for one of the lead marine archaeologists. And um, it took a while for him to get back to me. In fact, I think it took uh, about eight or nine weeks or more. And, and he called me because well, you called us about the investigator. How can we help you? I said, you've got the ship. I have the story. You see? <laughs> so I was very fortunate because I've had a nice relationship with Parks Canada over the years in identifying, helping to identify some of the artifacts and some of the uh, various things on the ship that they've recovered. And uh, there's still a lot more to be done, but because of the location and the expense in doing archaeological work in that sort of environment, they have not you know, really gone forward with that. But the ship is there, and she's in very, very good condition. So what about Franklin's men? I told you Franklin was stuck there, and you know they were very far away from any help. They never did get it. They tried to walk out as well, and this is what happened to them. 
all 129 men died. Nobody made it home. This image was painted by an Austrian Arctic explorer in the late 18th, 19th century, and he had been in some very perilous situations as well. So this is quite accurate because what he did was he went and, and researched the men and the expedition and the artifacts that were found many years later from the skeletons and the things that were cast aside, and he did this painting called Starvation Cove which uh, does feature actually some of the men who were lost with Sir, Sir John Franklin. So I think that uh, if you look at it, and given the story I've told you about the investigators, they were pretty fortunate not to have ended up like Franklin's men, but they were certainly going right down that road. Right down that road. Question? How many men died in the sledging parties that the clerk sent out? He never sent those parties out because they were rescued. They were rescued, exactly, exactly. Um, but it's it was pretty much determined afterward that they would not have made it. They would not have made it. Yeah. Yes? How many of the ship's logs survived? From the investigator? Yeah, that's, that's the story in the story, because I got into that. Uh, there's very little left, okay? The journals from McClure are only partially survived. They're only, only through the very early part of the voyage. And what I found out when I was researching, and this is what was fascinating, is that a lot of the material was lost, okay? Because what you had to do is you had to turn this material, your private logs, right, and any sort of writings and images, you had to turn that over to the captain, right? Because it had to go to the Admiralty, and the Admiralty had to have a look at it. Well, as soon as McClure got his hands on these things, he pitched them. He got rid of them. So he made sure they were gone. And the story that got out was his story. Well, that's part of the story in the book, as a matter of fact, because there were some people that were able to preserve their writings and get them back and actually publish them in some cases. But uh, here's one thing I did discover. McClure not only had a journal, he had two journals. He made a copy. He made a copy. So when you're looking at you know, his writings and what survived, what are you looking at? The original or his copy? Was it a faithful copy? This is where the story gets very, very complicated. The uh, what's left of the journals actually do exist in the Royal Geographic Society Library and Archives in London, and I've I've actually held them in my hands and, and done the research from them. But uh, that story is all detailed in my book as well because I was able to track those journals all the way from 1850 to the present day. Uh, I, I read the, the whole thing, and that is what the, the story, you know, um, makes it really so fascinating is the fact that there was this whole story within the story about the actual writings. But here's one thing I noticed. At the time things got really bad, in like that third year of the expedition, that's when all the journals go silent, okay? That's when everything goes missing in all the writings. It's like they're okay right up until then, and gone, gone. So it's no coincidence that that occurred.